Hello, my name is Monica Embers and I'm an associate professor at Tulane University. And for this CME, I'll be talking about antibiotic treatment of Bartonella infections. This is prepared for Invisible International's Physician Education Platform funded by the Monte Calvo Foundation. So I do not have any financial arrangements or affiliations with any commercial entities whose products, research, or services may be discussed in these materials. So the learning objectives for this uh, CME are first to describe the current standard of care for treatment of Bartonella infections. Uh, secondly, to discuss the different microenvironments in which Bartonella species exist in vivo or in the host and how those environments affect antibiotic efficacy. And finally, to look at research efforts and results with the single and combination therapy for Bartonellosis. So what are uh, Bartonella bacteria? These are alpha proteobacteria that are gram negative. They have um, a fairly long doubling time. And what's important is that they can infect erythrocytes or red blood cells and other cell types. The diseases that are most well characterized that are caused by uh, Bartonella species are three. They are cat scratch disease, carrion's disease, and trench fever. And I'll go, each, I'll go through each of these. <clears throat> so the first is cat scratch disease, and this is the most commonly recognized disease associated with Bartonella. Uh, the causative agent is Bartonella hensilae, and typically it manifests as enlarged and usually tender lymph nodes that appear one to three weeks after the infection, uh, usually through a cat bite or scratch and, um, and the flea. So basically the flea defecates and the, the, um, the feces get on the claw. So the flea has the bacteria, the feces get on the claw of the cat, and then the cat scratches you and inoc inoculates you. Um, sometimes uh, patients can present with fever, which is mild, but occasionally it can be as high as uh, 104. <clears throat> in an estimated, uh, it's, an, it's estimated that 12,000 outpatients and 500 inpatients are diagnosed with CSD annually. Uh, there was a survey of over 3,000 primary care providers, and it was found that clinicians in the Pacific and Southern regions were more likely to have diagnosed cat scratch disease, as well as clinicians who saw pediatric patients, regardless of their specialty. So carrion's disease um, was discovered in the 1900s, and the causative agent is called Bartonella bacilliformis. This is particularly relevant in Peru and the Andean mountain range. Uh, there are two distinct phases. The first phase is, the acute phase is called Arroyo, Arroyo fever, which is characterized by headache, fever, muscle aches, and anemia. <clears throat> and then the second phase uh, or chronic phase is called Verruga peruana, which involves um, red sores on the skin that can be blood filled and transmission typically occurs through sand flies and fleas. And finally, we have trench fever. Uh, the causative agent of trench fever, trench fever is Bartonella quintana, and this was discovered during World War I. Um, symptoms include fever, headache, rash, and bone pain, and this is currently emerging in homeless populations throughout the world. Transmission typically occurs through the body, through the body louse. So, Probably the most troubling complications associated with Bartonella infections include the neurological presentations. Uh, patients have been characterized as having hallucinations, muscle pains, severe headaches, anxiety, memory loss, cognitive dysfunction, seizures, paralysis, um, diminished tactile sensation, and depression, and also acute onset ne neuropsychiatric syndrome. Patients with neuropsychiatric disorders who reported concurrent cutaneous lesions, as shown in this uh, journal article here, for, for that set of patients, 29 of 33 had positive serology for PCR and um, for PCR, had positive serology or PCR for Bartonella. 
which indicates if you see this kind of rash uh, that the patient should probably be tested for Bartonella and it's associated with neuropsychiatric um, manifestations. So there also can be uh, complications, especially in immunocompromised individuals. Um, this includes bacillary angiomatosis, which is lesions on, in the skin, under the skin, within the bone and other organs, bacillary pileosis, which are lesions or blood-filled cysts in the liver and spleen, blood culture negative endocarditis. Um, <clears throat> typically that involves inflammation of one or more heart valves, and this can be life-threatening. And then uveitis, which is redness, pain, and blurred vision. So uh, the relationships between reservoirs and incidental hosts are, are largely unknown, but there are a variety of different vectors and there are a variety of different natural hosts. Um, the, the bacteria um, and the host uh, networks facilitate transmission through multiple vectors and other um, means such as a bite, lick, or needle use. Um, we know that there are known vectors and suggested vectors where sand flies, fleas, and lice are definitely known vectors, um, but ticks, spiders, uh, head lice, bed bug mites, <clears throat> and other hematophagous arthropods have been suggested as vectors for Bartonella. We also know that uh, human Bartonellosis is an underappreciated public health problem. And we've talked about a number of these manifestations, but um, Bartonella can also be associated with uh, hemangio endotheliomas, arthritis, and vasculitis. So this is a, um, a review article uh, that was published a number of years ago. <clears throat> And what we can take, the, the, the take home message for, from this article is that to date, there is no single treatment that is effective for all Bartonella associated diseases. Um, it was found that antibiotics do not significantly affect the cure rate in patients with Bartonella lymphadenopathy. Um, those with Bartonella bacteremia should be treated with genomycin and doxycycline. Um, this combination is also considered the best treatment for endocarditis, but erythromycin is the first line antibiotic for the treatment of angioproliferative lesions. And for Veruga peruana, rifampicin and streptomycin can be used. So really uh, what we're looking at is a treatment based on um, anecdotal evidence from pa pa patient case reports that are based on the manifestation of disease. So you can see that um, if we just have an uncomplicated cat scratch disease, there's no treatment. Um, if we have Arroyo fever with intraerythrocytic presence, chloramphenicol is warranted, um, trench fever, uh, doxycycline and genomycin, and then rifampin is used uh, when Veruga peruana is, is uh, suspected. And then with um, blood culture negative endocarditis, again, um, genomycin and doxycycline is recommended. However, I think it's important to recognize that none of these treatments have been tested in preclinical models. So, um, this is just based on trial and error for the most part. So here, uh, this is a very complicated slide, but there, there are basically two, um, two reviews. One is a meta uh, systemic review and meta-analysis, and the other is a, a mini review. And from the sy systematic review, um, it was shown that for cat scratch disease, antibiotics did not significantly affect the cure rate or time to achieve cure. And in chronic bacteremia, genomycin and doxycycline did significantly increase the resolution rate, um, but the recommended treatment was not better than other regimens for infect infectious endocarditis and bacillary angiomatosis. And if you look at this mini review, <clears throat> what they found was that the in vitro and in vivo antibiotic susceptibilities 
of Bartonella don't correlate well with a number of uh, different antibiotics. For example, penicillin has no in vivo efficacy, but it showed very low MICs uh, when tested in vitro. So it's important to think, to go back and think about the infection process for Bartonella. Um, so once in the host, uh, Bartonella can either be extracellular, intracellular, or um, it could be encased in biofilms. And so this is the common infection strategy. You can see that um, the blood sucking arthropod defecates, it enters the skin, and the, um, the general concept is that <clears throat> following the transmission, the Bartonella colonized the primary niche, which probably involves entry into migratory cells, uh, mononuclear migratory cells, enters the vascular endothelium, and at that point can traverse the endothelium and um, seed into the bloodstream where they can invade um, erythrocytes and reinfect the primary niche. So this is where they uh, persist in the infected host. Shown here is an image of um, blood culture negative endocarditis caused by Bartonella hensilae. And so on the left is an echocardiogram from a patient with BCNE. Um, this is a bicuspid aortic valve with the left coronary leaflet almost entirely replaced by a large vegetation shown here by this arrow. And then on the right, a gheme sustain of the patient showing extensive fibro fibrosis and co coxobacilli on the aortic valve. And these were confirmed to be Bartonella hensilae. And again, typically in BCNE, the, the Bartonella bacteria are encased in biofilms. So Bartonella engage in a number of different immune evasion strategies. Um, like we said, Bartonella colonizes a niche within the body and seeds bacteria that can infect and survive inside red blood, red blood cells. Host antibodies have no effect on intraerythrocytic bacteria, but they do prevent new waves of uh, par erythrocytic parasitism. Intracellular bacteria have been pro proposed to affect dendritic cell maturation through an unknown mechanism, and they've also been shown to inhibit cytokine production and T cell proliferation by inducing the expression of interleukin 10. A type 4 secretion system is essential for establishing persistent intraerythrocytic uh, invasion. So let's take a look now at the Bartonella microenvironments in human hosts. So these need to be replicated in vitro for antibiotic susceptibility testing. The first is the extracellular planktonic. The second is the red blood cells where they have limited replication. Um, the third is monocytic migratory cells and vascular endothelium. And then finally, biofilms. So <clears throat> this, is, um, this is a paper uh, published from the Motor Lab in Germany, and it shows the presence of Bartonella quintana in a biofilm of human heart valve. Uh, a section was taken from a patient who had BCNE, and they did a specific kind of stain called FISH, or fluorescent in situ hybridization where they bind a DNA probe to specific sequences of the bacteria. And here, uh, DAPI, this is just a nuclear stain, but here's the Bartonella quintana specific stain. And you can see here in the aortic valve tissue that it's lighting up positive. And here is a... Um, publication that came out of the Zhang lab a couple of years ago, and it looked at the effect of different drugs and drug combinations on stationary phase and biofilm uh, recovered cells of Bartonella hensilae, and this was all done in vitro. And I need to preface this by saying that the biofilms are more um, 
just aggregates of bacteria uh, that were grown in, in a culture tube or in a plate. Um, but basically what they found was that when they looked at all these different antibiotics in monotherapy, on, like on their own, they did not get um, reduced growth of the bacteria. However, when they made combinations, uh, here showing four dual combinations, they did get growth inhibition. So this is very similar to what we found for uh, Borrelia infections as well. So uh, we did a study <clears throat> in our lab and we looked at the minimum inhibitory concentrations for Bartonella hensilae using different antibiotics and different um, culture medias. And what we found is that we did get some decent growth inhibition um, of the extracellular, extracellular Bartonella with uh, rifampicin, clarithromycin, and azlocillin, a little bit better for doxy, a little bit for doxycycline, but it really wasn't that great for um, genomycin in vitro. And uh, we performed another test where we looked at um, Bartonella grown in a cell-free uh, liquid culture assay, and this that being at extracellular, and then this DH82-based cell assay, which means that we incubate the bacteria with a dog histiocytic cell line, and the cell the bacteria are taken up by those cells, and so they become intracellular. We clear everything that isn't um, hasn't gone into the cell by washing them away. And then we do the antibiotic susceptibility testing. And what we found was that we got good um, minimum bactericidal concentrations when the bacteria were extracellular, but when inside the cells, uh, these antibiotics were completely ineffective, showing an MBC of greater than 16 micrograms per mil. So, then we have um, a number, we, we repeated some of this work and um, we found that if we did the same thing with a biofilm uh, where we grow the Bartonella bacteria on a matrix of extracellular protein in a plate that we see the exact same thing. The susceptibility to these antibiotics is minimal to none. So when we looked at the um, DH82 base cell assay again, um, but we instead we combined two different antibiotics. Here it was azithromycin and ampicillin or azithromycin and azlocillin. What we can see, um, this is the CFU per mil. So a zero means that it killed we can see here that these antibiotic combinations at low doses were quite effective at killing the bacteria inside the cells. So what does this mean? Um, basically what it means is that we need to consider the use of combination antibiotic therapy for treating Bartonella infections to make sure that we target all the niches that the bacteria occupy inside the host. And to be able to do this, um, to test this, we need to have appropriate preclinical animal models. And so we can do a number of things in vitro. We have free Bartonella growth inhibition. We have intracellular growth inhibition, which we've, we've shown. And then we have some in vivo model systems. Um, in, immune deficient mice are decent models for uh, Bartonella hensilae infection. And if you're testing a therapeutic, uh, you can look in the tissues to see if you eradicate the infection. But really, mice don't become bacteremic for long periods of time. So to test for bacterial clearance, um, you really need to use a susceptible host like cats. 
uh, cats have long-term bacteremia, oftentimes they do get um, disease as well. It's not, they're not just uh, reservoir hosts. And um, so the, the mice can be an acute infection model, but cats, however, can be a persistent infection model for testing novel therapeutics for uh, bartonellosis. So in terms of the overall results and conclusions, um, I would say that preclinical studies aimed at determining antibiotic efficacy for Bartonella infections have not been performed. Um, Bartonella is treated with different antibiotics based on the manifestation of disease and the case reports that have been published. However, there's no specific treatment regimen that's been established for Bartonella infections. Our studies have shown a significant difference in antibiotic susceptibility with different microenvironments and combination therapy shows promise for in vitro killing for Bartonella hensilae. At this point, we certainly need more research to include other Bartonella strains in the assessment in animal models. These studies should pave the way for randomized controlled trials of combination therapy in patients who have chronic Bartonellosis. And with that, I will leave you with my list of references. Thank you.